Jane Strauss, author of Morgan, American Financier. There are a couple pictures inside your book. Can you tell us the story behind these two? Those pictures were taken by the photographer Edward Steichen in 1903. He was just starting out as a photographer, and Morgan was sitting for a portrait paint, having his portrait painted. And he hated to sit still for very long. So um, uh, Alfred Stieglitz, who was a famous photographer, decided that Morgan should have a photo, the painter should have a photograph to work from, and hired Edward Steichen, who was just starting out in his career, to do it. Steichen came in, he actually posed a janitor in the shot while he set it up to get it ready for Morgan. Morgan blew in, sat down very quickly, took the pose that he always took for the portrait painter, and Steichen made the quick exposure and took that shot. However, he didn't really like the pose. He thought it was too formal, too self-conscious, and he asked Morgan to rearrange himself a little bit, to move his head slightly to one side and get in a more comfortable position. Morgan was not pleased to be told to rearrange himself a little bit, so he bristled a bit. And um, Steichen immediately saw that this was the Morgan. He saw these sort of piercing eyes and, and this imposing presence and um, immediately took that shot. That's the second shot. It's on your right. It, and Morgan has his hand on the handle of his over chair. Here. No, yeah. on this shot over yeah, here. Yeah, that shot. His, he's got um, his hand on the handle of the chair. It's a metal chair. And when the photograph came out, it makes it look like he's holding a dagger, that he's sort of about to advance out of the frame like a capitalist pirate of popular mythology. So um, Steigen had these two photographs, one the official one, and won this second one, which was sort of Morgan in fierce mode. He showed Morgan both of them. Morgan hated the second one because it makes him look so fierce and tore it up and um, ordered many copies of the first one, which was the blander, more conventional picture. And uh, Steichen was so angry at him for tearing up the picture that years later when Morgan's librarian asked for, thought that the, the second picture was much more dynamic and assertive and alive, she asked for copies of it and, and Steichen kept them waiting for years he, because he was so angry at Morgan for having torn up the first one. It's the most famous image of Morgan, the one with the hand on the dagger. It's, but the thing I want to ask you about in these photographs is mm -hmm. how, first of all, how old was he here? He was in his middle 60s. And you write many, many times about the nose. Mm -hmm. Now, you look at this picture, you don't see anything that unusual about the nose. It was slightly touched up. Um, Morgan had an inherited skin condition called rhinophyma, which is excess growth of sebaceous tissue. And in his 50s, it turned his nose into a hideous purple bulb. It, was, it looks like an alcoholic nose, although that was not the cause of it. W.C. Fields had something rather similar. Um, and now it could be easily corrected by laser surgery. It could actually have been co corrected during Morgan's lifetime by surgery, but for various reasons, he chose not to do that. I can go into that if you'd like, but it was a very big fact in his life. He was so public and he was constantly meeting new people and he would kind of glare at you when he met you because you couldn't look at him without looking at his nose and his handshake and his imposing glare was kind of daring people to flinch or to react or in some way look, you know, not deal with his nose. Steichen, when he took that picture, afterwards wrote that looking into J.P. Morgan's eyes is like staring into the lights of an oncoming express train. And, I mean, to imagine being this very public figure, very much being criticized on all sides for some of what he was doing, and having this deformity that everybody had to deal with when they met him. So it's, I think part of that is in the picture, that sort of glaring defiance. But um, I actually tried to find the negatives of those pictures from Steichen to see if he had touched them up or whether he touched it up in the print, and I wasn't able to find the originals. And you have a photograph on the front cover. How old was he in this? About, he was a few years older. I, we don't know, I would guess that photograph is around 1910 and the other one is 1903, but, but that's just a guess from how he looked. I don't know for sure when that picture was taken. When did you first get to know him? Well, I first started on this project in 1983. I would say that it was um, 16, several... 16 years 50, ago. Well, 16 since it's out. I finished it last August, so it was, took me 15 years to write this book. So I first met him in 1983. I would say I didn't really get to know him for about 10 years after that. It took a very long time to find my way into this character. He was very alien to me. He was not articulate. He was not introspective. He didn't want to know any of the things I wanted to know about him. And so that was, in a way, the most centrally difficult 
aspect of writing this life. Other difficult aspects were learning about finance since I was an English major and I really didn't start out with any familiarity with this. But Morgan's character, which has to be at the center of any biography that's going to come to life, was just extremely difficult for me to get to know. So, Where were you living when you started to get to know him and how did you get to know him? I was living in New York and I stayed there the whole time. His life is very much involved, engaged in the history of New York. He lived both in New York and in London and I went to England many times to do research but I stayed basically in New York the whole time. I got to know him primarily through archival material. He died in 1913 so there were a couple of people still alive that I could talk to and I'll come back to that in a minute but mostly it was through letters and diaries and his, the Morgan Library in New York turned out to have a basement full of uncatalogued papers, which was really what got me going on this project, because it was just a biographer's dream, all this material that had not really been looked at before. So I was reading his grandfather's diaries for 30 years, his son's letters home, he had, both, he had two wives, one died young, and then a second wife. I found their diaries, I found all of his childhood school books, his letters home from whenever he went across the Atlantic, which was a lot. Um, journals he kept when he was traveling in Egypt so there was just an amazing amount of material plus all the dealers of the, uh, uh, the records of the art dealers that he was he was a major art collector and I found at the Morgan Library records of all of that and bank books syndicate books registers of what his firm was doing what were you doing in 1983 I had been working as a book critic at Newsweek magazine for about four years uh, and so I was writing about books that were coming out at the moment. I, my previous book was a biography of Alice James. I did that in the late 70s, came out in 1980. And um, the contrast between the James family and the Morgan family was really quite striking. Um, the Jameses were intellectuals. They were extremely articulate. They, they lived in language in a way, which for a writer was extremely helpful. And I didn't realize how much I'd been able to kind of stand on their shoulders until I was dealing with Morgan and his family because they weren't writers. They weren't questioning themselves in the same way that the Jameses were. So it's the same period, late 19th century, but a different universe. And, and trying to get Morgan to talk to me was really, really the hardest thing about this biography. And clearly, I realized about five years into it, he wasn't gonna, I couldn't get him to speak my language. I had to learn his language. And it was the language of what he did. He was, um, Henry Adams said of Theodore Roosevelt that he was pure act. And you could set, have said that about Morgan as well. He was instinctive, he was intuitive. I think he was actually quite a brilliant man, but it's not the kind of brilliance that people trained in the humanities know about. And I had to really learn to see how his intelligence operated. Um, I did find a lot of his letters, and they were better than, I'm, I mean, I'm exaggerating slightly to say that he was inarticulate. When he, when he was interested in something, he absolutely could express it, and I found there were wonderful glimpses, but not enough, not as many as for the Jameses. I want to ask you about the women in his life. Mm -hmm. Who is this? That was his first wife. Her name was Amelia Sturgis. She was the daughter of a prominent New York merchant and patron of the arts named Jonathan Sturgis. He fell in love with her shortly after he moved to New York when he was 20 years old in 1857 and courted her for a couple of years. They got engaged in 59 and, uh, sorry, in 1960 they got engaged and the winter, they were going to be married in October of 61. That winter before their wedding, she came down with a series of colds and a bad cough that would not go away. By the summer, she was so sick that she said, I don't think I can marry you. We should postpone the wedding. He said, nonsense. We'll take you to the sun in the Mediterranean and fix you right up. And they got married in October of 1861 in her parents' parlor in New York. He, she was so frail, he had to hold her up at the altar. And she kept the veil over her face during the ceremony because she felt she was so thin, she wasn't pretty anymore. He took her to um, Paris where lung specialists diagnosed her tuberculosis, which came as a shock to him. He hadn't realized that's what it was. Then they went to Algiers and then to Nice. He rented a villa in Nice and he was the most, it was really quite surprising. I found her diaries and letters which tell this story in a very dramatic way. He carried her up and down seven flights of stairs a day in Paris. He brought her her favorite foods, bought birds to keep her company. Eventually, he, bought, he called, asked her mother to come stay with them because she was just getting sicker and sicker, and he felt he couldn't nurse her himself. Um, the mother came over, and this was in Nice in January and February of 1862, and she died four months after her wedding.
Um, and he was heartbroken, obviously, and I think in some ways never really got over that loss. She was very lively, intelligent, curious, wonderful girl. I, I kind of got to know her as he got to know her through her letters and diaries. And, and she died at the age of 20 through 25. You know, she was all youthful promise. It was, he never had to find out what that marriage would have been like. It was kind of preserved in amber for him at that youthful stage. How old was he in 1861? He was, she was a year older, so he was 20, Two and she was 23 when they got married, and, and then four months later, I'm sorry, he was 24 and she was 25. How was he able at age 24 in 1861 to leave the United States and not fight in the Civil War? Well, he came, he was from a wealthy family, um, and his father by this time was working as a merchant banker in London. Uh, he actually, Morgan, both sides of his family came to, the, to America before the Revolution, so they were really members of the American patriciate. Um, you could buy a sub you could pay for a substitute to fight in the Civil War. You'd pay three hundred dollars and somebody else would go in your place, which is what Morgan did. Many other men did that as well. It sounds to us like shirking, and certainly many men who didn't fight felt guilty about it for the rest of their lives. Um, it was at the time quite an acceptable thing to do in certain classes and for certain people, and surprising people didn't fight. The, in the James family, for instance, which I know a lot about, the younger two boys did go off to war. William and Henry did not. Um, Morgan didn't. Um, some of the Adamses did and some of them didn't. It, 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 was, it was interesting to see which, how it lines up. Um, he and his father hated the idea of the Civil War because it was going to disrupt business. They were doing cotton trading with England, they were trying to build America with European capital, build America's future, and war interrupts commerce, it interrupts all sorts of other things. They weren't terribly interested in the issue of slavery and the moral cause of the Civil War. They were more interested in keeping business going. Another woman in his life is this one right here. Who is that? That's his second wife, Frances Louisa Tracy whom he married about three years later, 1865, just at the end of the Civil War, right after Lincoln was shot and the war was concluded. That was an okay marriage for maybe 10 or 15 years. They had four children who were also in the picture you just held up. Um, and, uh, but very quickly it became clear that they had very different tastes and very different instincts. He loved New York. He loved throngs of people. He was workaholic. He liked activity and um, travel, adventurous travel. She was much more domestic and quiet. She liked being home with the children. She wanted to leave New York for suburban New Jersey. She wasn't very interested in art. He was passionate about art. So after about 15 years, he kind of kept the Atlantic between them. He would go off to Europe in the spring and summer with um, a party of friends and travel around often. Sometimes he would take one of his daughters and then later he would take a mistress. Um, and when he came back from Europe, he would send his wife abroad in the fall and winter with one of their daughters and a chauffeur and a paid companion. So pretty much they lived separate lives after about 1880. Did they ever divorce? No. Divorce was really not an option in that world. Some people did, but it was very scandalous and shocking. And interestingly enough, it was always the women. The women were. It was more disruptive for the woman. It, women were objects of scandal, even if they had done nothing wrong. And a couple of the people, the Morgans knew, who women who did get divorced, moved to Europe just because it was a much more accepting, forgiving society. Um, and also, I think, in professional terms, Morgan was a conservative banker with a s reputation for integrity. Divorce didn't figure into that picture. This picture right here is of which that woman in his life? That is a woman named Edith Sybil Randolph, who was his first mistress, or the first one that I was able to find anything out about. She was a widow, very beautiful, as you can see from the picture. Uh, pro um, younger than he, he was probably, he was 1890, so he was... Um, in his 50s, uh, he was about 53, and she was probably in her late 30s. Her husband had died a few years before. She had two children, and Morgan was with her for about five years. Um, again, traveling to Europe with her, um, seeing her in New York, taking her on his yacht cruises. And his wife didn't, in the wife's diaries, there are rather sad entrances about Mrs. Randolph being around in a lot of Morgan's parties. There were so many people around that I think it was possible for him to sort of muffle the truth about what was going on. Um, and he was with her for about five years and then 
I think the wife, his wife found out in one of her diaries, it says one day, spoke to P about Mrs. R. And that's the last mention of Mrs. R in Mrs. Morgan's diaries. So I think that was a fairly dramatic moment. He then had to kind of keep it more secret. And he was not, it's interesting, he was, he lived very, he was much more of a European than an American Puritan about all this. The European aristocrats had mistresses. They would travel to other friends' country houses. They would stay in European hotels. They trusted their friends not to talk. It was sort of accepted, especially in the Prince of Wales's set. He had these women with whom he traveled and everybody knew about it and nobody really talked about it. And I think Morgan sort of did more or less the same thing. But once his wife was found out it was a problem, and the other problem was that this Mrs. Randolph was relatively young, not wealthy, and she needed a husband, and Morgan was not going to get divorced. So a rather convenient solution came along. Another prominent American man of their world was William C. Whitney, who had been Secretary of the Navy under Grover Cleveland. He had also been quite taken with Mrs. Randolph while he was married, and his wife made a big fuss about it, so that was the end of that. And then his wife died in the late 1880s, early 90s, actually. And so Whitney married Edith Randolph, and Morgan took up with her best friend, who was a woman named Adelaide Louisa Townsend, who was quite a wonderful person, not as beautiful as Edith Whitney, Edith Randolph Whitney, um, but very energetic and full of life and, and a real match for him in her appreciation of, of art and travel. And um, she was sort of a wonderful spirit. I knew, I met someone who had actually known her, um, an older woman who knew her, and also I met, eventually met her grandson, which was a lot of fun because he could tell me quite a lot about her life and the house that she lived in on Park Avenue. And he said that there was a special back entrance for Mr. Morgan and that the children were told to disappear when Mr. Morgan arrived. Um, it, I mean, there, because, as I say, because Morgan died so long ago, it was hard to find people who actually had memories of, of any of this, and that was thrilling. Here's a picture of a dining event and you can see Mr. Morgan there on the right, and who's the lady on the left? Actually, Morgan's in the center, toward the rear of the picture, in the back. Oh, in the back? In the back. Oh, okay. The center, it's, it's hard to tell. I think we've described it not very well, because we say in the center, and it's hard to tell which is the you center. Know, I he's, was, he's not the man I thought he the had the white mustache. There. Yes, right. That's, I, I, we have to fix so, that. So he's all the way back right, right there. Right there, exactly. Yeah. And who's this woman on uh, your side? Yes, on the left of him is Adelaide Douglas. Um, it's a small picture, so you won't really be able to see what she looks like. She's under your, yes, she's in that other picture on the right right-hand side of the book. Um, and you can see that she's not a great beauty, but she had tremendous presence and elegance. And they would go to Europe and see Edward VII and Kaiser Wilhelm, and they really traveled in fairly distinguished company. And she was very much up to that world. His wife really didn't enjoy that world very much. Where did he meet her? Adelaide? I don't know. Very possibly... Um, they were in similar social circles. Her husband was a yachtsman, as Morgan was. He, I would suspect she met her, he met her through Edith Randolph, who was her best friend. Actually, there's a nice little footnote to that story, because Edith Randolph mar named her daughter Adelaide for Adelaide Douglas. Adelaide named her daughter Sybil, because it was Edith Sybil Randolph. And to this day, the descendants of those two women keep naming their daughters Adelaide and Sybil, 100 years later. How long did he stay with her? Um, well, more, he, met, he started up with her, I think, in about 1895. The last time I've been able to chart him taking her to Europe with him was 1908, but they stayed close, really, for the rest of his life. She built a townhouse on Park Avenue near his house in 1909 to 1911. Her grandson tells me that Morgan paid for it, but I wasn't able to track that. But she remained the main person in his life, I think, outside of his marriage until he died. What was the uh, Town Topics gossip sheet? It was a wonderful, useful uh, source for a biographer and quite a lot of fun to read, even if you're not a biographer. It was a fabulous gossip sheet that everybody in New York read, and of course everybody denied that they read it. Um, and it was run by a colorful character uh, Call, who called himself Colonel William Dalton Mann. And he had, uh, he was actually a blackmailer, and he would often men drop some hint about a prominent man and then wait to be paid for future silence. And there's a key to the way he worked, which is that he would 
tell some gossipy story without using names and then someplace nearby on the same page or on the next page he would mention the names of the people involved so you have to be very clever at figuring it out so he would say for instance that i hear there's a storm cooking up in bar harbor this summer uh, a distinguished former member of the cabinet is pursuing a beautiful widow famous for her physical attractions and a famous financier is also on the scene present with his yacht and he takes the um, the widow and her friends sailing on the broad Atlantic. Well, nearby, a um, man published the names of William C. Whitney, Edith Randolph, and Morgan, but you had to know the key to be able to figure this out. So um, he was try. somebody sued him for libel, I guess, a few years later. And at his trial, he, the names of all the prominent men who'd given him anywhere from two to $25,000 came out, and he was asked why. Um, he, he said, Morgan gave him, I think, twenty-five. Hundred and the trial lawyer said, "Well, why? What? What? What is that?" And and man said, "Well, it was a loan." And and um, the lawyer said, "Well, why would J.P. Morgan give you a loan?" And he said, "Well, um, he just, you know, it was just he thought I could use the money and that I would pay it back and it would be all right after that." And so, who's this woman in his life? That is probably the most interesting woman in his life to me, and the one about whom I made the most, had the most fun figuring out, finding out about her. Her name was Belle da Costa Green, and she was his librarian. He was a fabulous art collector, and he concentrated in New York on rare books and illuminated manuscripts and prints and drawings. And he built a library to house them between 1902 and 1906. Charles McKim built the library, and it's still there, and on 36th Street and, Mad and Madison Avenue. By the time the library was almost finished, he decided he needed a librarian to manage and catalog and the collections and help him buy new ones. And he was introduced to Bell Green by his nephew, Junius Spencer Morgan, who was a serious bibliophile and connoisseur of books and prints and drawings. Junius introduced him to this young woman who was working at the Princeton University Library as a clerk she said she was 22 years old. She immediately took charge of Morgan's literary collections and began to discipline dealers who were charging him too much and to organize the collections and to somewhat limit his Morgan's voracious tastes and, and, and kind of put things in order. She was a wonderful, flamboyant character. She supposedly once said, just because I am a librarian doesn't mean I have to dress like one and she wore couturier gowns and jewels to work. She stayed at Claridge's in London and in Paris at the Ritz. She went to European auctions where all the other buyers were men, and she would walk off with the best items with some fabulous Cal Caxton manuscripts and un Gutenberg Bibles and just wonderful things. And she had love affairs. The main love affair she had was with Bernard Berenson, who was a leading art scholar, and that went on for many years. She wrote fantastic letters to him. But who she was, her background was not clear, and she said that she had, her mother was a distinguished woman from Richmond, Virginia, and the mother had taught music to people in Princeton while Belle and her siblings were at school. I tried to track this down because I was so curious about her. She was such a wonderful, interesting character, and I wanted to know where she came from and who she was. And as I tried to follow out all those leads, none of them tracked. I, I hired a genealogist in Richmond, Virginia, to try to find Greeners. She said that her name was Belle da Costa Green and that her grandmother was Genevieve da Costa Van Vliet. Um, you're giving away this. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, to make a long story short, I found out by a combination of luck, accident, and the sort of pathological curiosity that takes over biographers' lives that her father was the first black man to graduate from Harvard. His name was Richard Theodore Greener. He graduated, he started Harvard in 1865, just at the end of the Civil War, graduated in 1870, and had five children, including Belle. Her name was not Belle da Costa Green, it was Belle Marion Greener. Her mother was African-American as well. I found Belle's birth certificate, actually, in, in Washington. She was born in Washington, and, and it, it tells her birth date and lists C for colored. Um, and the family lived in Washington for some years. Greener was dean of the Howard University Law School. He was a very distinguished lawyer and scholar, an active Republican. The Republicans rewarded him for his service recruiting blacks for the party by making him the secretary of the Grant Monument, in, the Ulysses S. Grant Monument in New York. And um, 
He was appointed U.S. Consul in Vladivostok by McKinley and Roosevelt. But at some point around that time in the late 1890s, the family split up. And they, they were, he was the darkest. The mother was very light-skinned and the children were very light-skinned. So they dropped the R off the end of their name. And um, the, her, the, the mother said her name was Genevieve I. Green Widow although Mr. Greener was very much alive, and they brought, invented the name Da Costa, I think, to explain their exotic looks. And Belle passed as white for the rest of her life, as far as I know. I don't think Morgan ever knew. What would he have done white. had he known? I don't think, this is, it has to be pure speculation, I don't think he would have done anything if he'd known. I think once she became indispensable to him at his library, he would have appreciated that, and he might have even admired her for I mean she, with on her own intelligence and initiative she created a life for herself that few women of that time black or white could have imagined she it was just remarkable and I say this about Morgan not minding because one of the surprises for me in this story was what a meritocrat he turned it out to be even though his reputation was as being an imperious snob and really only dealing with the waspocracy and and um, the reputation of the Morgan firm is certainly as blue blood as you can get but he was constantly on the lookout for interesting people who were competent talented who wanted to do interesting things and had new ideas and he set them up with the resources to do what they were good at I mean Belle Green could go to Europe and I mean she would cable him about what she could buy and what they could spend she always wanted to spend less he said you know if it's 70,000 if it's 100,000 we want this it's the best thing you you buy it let me read a little bit of what you wrote. Bell on occasion defied him, and their worst battles came when he suspected she might leave him for another man. In the fall of 1911, he heard a rumor that she was engaged, quote, which made him rave and foam at the mouth, she told B.B., who was... Baird, Bernard Berenson. He really was so ridiculous that I became disgusted and angry and told him that had it, not, had it been true, it was none of his business, which caused our relations to be somewhat strained for a day or two. Finally, he came to me with tears and crocodile, crocodile heartbreakings, beseeching me not to leave him, not to marry anyone, and not to look at any man. I confess that in spite of my really sincere love and admiration for him, I was thoroughly annoyed and disgusted, and I could hardly keep from telling him so. Yes. You believe that she actually confronted him like that? Well, I think she probably did. Bell's, uh, it's a very interesting problem in this story because people are always positioning themselves in relation to Morgan in a funny way. I think his wealth and power was so great that other people constantly feel they need to sort of, it, it bends the sight lines a little bit. You can't tell how much they're showing off for their own correspondence about their, what, what they've said to him and what they've done and how much is straight. But I think that probably is more or less straight. I think he was extremely possessive. He did not want her to, um, she, he, he thought that he owned her in a way, and she hated that, and qu quite rightly she hated it. Who is this in your book? That is Lady Victoria Sackville, and that was La Morgan's last romantic skirmish, as I've, at least as far as I've been able to find out. He met her in the early 1900s. She owned with her husband this wonderful, enormous estate in Kent called Knoll that had been in her family for centuries, um, and she had fabulous art collections, tapestries, ancestral portraits. Um, and in 1911, they had, there were the tax duties, were, they, they were estate, estate taxes were in, enacted in England, and she and her husband began to sell a few of their um, art objects in order to raise money to keep the estate going. And Morgan bought one of their portraits and some tapestries. And um, that transaction began this late life romance. He was 75 years old, 74 years old when it started. And um, she was in her early 40s. She was very beautiful. Uh, she was the daughter of, um, illegitimate daughter actually, of a man who'd been the American minister in London and a Spanish dancer. She was quite outrageous, quite narcissistic and vain. And um, took up with many elderly, wealthy men who stated she and her husband didn't have quite enough to keep this estate going, and so she um, secured the affections and the bank accounts of several elderly men and had this rather amusing late life, I mean, late in Morgan's life relationship with him. He saw her when he came to London a couple of years in a row. Um, she invited him out to Knoll. He bought tapestries and all kinds of things from her. Once he, the first thing he bought was a portrait of Miss Linley and her brother by Gainsborough, and Lady Sackville desperately wanted to get it back. So the sort of covert in this relationship, which is actually very funny, is that she's trying to get this 
this back. Morgan's trying to get more treasures from Noel because they have an absolute gilt-edged pedigree. And so the two of them are carrying on this flirtation, which I think probably in some way was genuine, but it was also quite, they were each pursuing other ends as well. You point out a number of times that he was big in the Episcopal Church. Very. It was extremely important to him. His father, uh, his grandfathers, one was a Unitarian, one was a Congregationalist, but his father had become an Episcopalian in the 1840s, and it was extremely important to Pierpont Morgan religion. It's hard to talk about because, like everything else, he doesn't say very much about it. But he was, he joined St. George's Church in New York, which is a low church Episcopal um, parish, and was hugely committed to it. I mean, he was a very religious man. He went to church a lot. He read the prayer book and the Bible on his own. He contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars, 500000 in 1892 alone, to the church. He would attend the triennial conventions of the Episcopal Church, which is, you know, the debates of the um, clergymen about church policy. And most laymen would have found that incredibly boring. Morgan, in the middle of his busy schedule, would take off three weeks every three years and go sit in and listen on these into these debates. He helped um, subsidize a new edition of the Book of Common Prayer. He could quote you anything you wanted from the Bible. Many people who disapprove of his career think it was hypocritical of him to be so religious and to be what they call a robber baron. I don't actually think he was a robber baron, and I don't think that his religion was about trying to pass through the eye of the needle. I think it was very deep-seated, passionate um, connection for him, and it, it expressed a lot of things that he couldn't express on his own, that, that, that he was deeply religious and that this was sort of an avenue for a lot of his emotion that, that, that he couldn't have told you about any other way, but it was deeply satisfying connection to him. Did the public know then, or did the church folks know then of his relationships with all these women? Probably. Uh, there are, um, there, uh, the, there, he would go to these conventions. I don't think he took Adelaide or Edith to the, Edith to the conventions, but he, he always had lots of female friends, whether or not they were mistresses, and he would take parties of ladies and bishops by special train to the convention in San Francisco, for instance, or in, um, Chicago, and one year the Archbishop of Canterbury was visiting, and Morgan entertained the Archbishop in Maine with Mrs. Douglas, and then went to Washington, where the Archbishop was meeting President Roosevelt, and there he was with his wife. So the bishops must have seen Mrs. Douglas on some occasions and Mrs. Morgan on other occasions. I don't know what they made of this, but it, I think it was a rather tolerant Episcopalianism is more tolerant than other, some other American denominations, and um, I'm sure he thought it was a sin, but not a, one that he had to worry about a lot. How much of the information on these women relationships in here is new? Most of it, actually. It was well known that he had mistresses and affairs outside of his marriage, but not these particular people. And in fact, the gossip was much wilder than the reality. He um, had a it was said that he built the Lying In Hospital in New York to take care of all the pregnancies that he was responsible. Lying In? Lying In is a maternity hospital. We don't use that term anymore, although in Boston it's still called the Boston Lying In. Um, he did actually build that hospital, but there was a less lurid explanation. His best friend and physician was a man named James W. Marcoux, who was an obstetrician, and he wanted to build a hospital that would give up-to-date, first-class care to poor women who couldn't afford it. And Morgan gave him a million dollars to build the hospital and gave $100,000 to it for the rest of his life, which is not what we think of uh, about J.P. Morgan, that he was helping poor women. Um, have children under the best possible circumstances. Did you uh, spend 15 years on this one subject? On J.P. Morgan? Yes. Yes, but it isn't one subject, it's about 30. But this one book? Yes, this one book took me 15 years. Every day of your life? Just about. I mean, for the last two years, it's been nights and weekends, too. Up to that, before that, I tried to sort of treat it like a marathon and pace myself and take vacations like everybody else and go to the movies once in a while. But as it just, I didn't think it would take 15 years. I thought it would take six. But once I was six years into it, I couldn't very well stop. And I think I deluded myself saying, oh, it's only going to be two more years. And then it was two more years after that. Do you have a family? No. I mean, I have, I do not have children, no. So... Um, I was about to say that I think 
I, I become sort of a joke among other writer, my writer friends. I think that they should all pay me a tithe because I make, them, I make them feel that they're not taking so long. Where do you live? I live in Manhattan. And how could you, I mean, this is a personal question, you may not want to answer, but how could you financially afford to do this? <laughs> well, that's a very good question, especially given who I was writing about, you know. I was not living in the manner to which Morgan would have been accustomed. I had a nice advance from Random House, but divide even a nice advance by 15 years and it doesn't work out very well. I got fellowships to supplement, which helped a lot. And I did teaching jobs, other some lecturing and some writing to um, help subsidize this project. But it's, I'll never do this again. I mean, 15 years is too long to spend on one project and it's not cost effective work. Was it worth it? Well, right now, um, since People seem to be enjoying this book and talking about it, and it's getting reviewed a lot. Right now, I feel it was worth it. If you'd asked me two years ago, I would say no way. I would have said no way. It's just too long. It's too hard. A friend of mine who was a biographer as well said that biographies are a little like marriages. You really have room for only one or two in your life. And I've had two. I think it might be time to do something else. Did you have support from the National Endowment? I did. Kind? I did. I had the National Endowment for the Humanities on this project and on the Alice James project as well, and the Guggenheim Foundation as well on, on both projects as well. So I've been very lucky in that regard. Let me ask you about a bunch of places in, that were in his life and just get you to describe them. Corsair. Corsair was his yacht. Um, he bought the first one in 1882. And it was already named Corsair. Many people think that was his name because it's piratical, and so it was appropriate that he called his yacht Corsair. But it was one of the first um, really most elegant yachts built in New York. It had been, had been owned by somebody else for a couple of years, and he bought it and uh, loved it. He had a country house up the Hudson just below West Point, so he used the yacht to commute to... Um, his country house and it was a wonderful place to have meetings he was very visible he could not cross the street much less the atlantic without arousing speculation in the stock market and the press so to have a private yacht for meetings um and for his personal life as well was extremely convenient how big was it it was the first one was 183 feet and at that that was the begin just yachts were beginning to become very popular in the gilded age and owners began to compete for size i think at that time when he bought it it was the largest yacht in the new york yacht club squadron but soon others surpassed it jay gould built a bigger one james gordon bennett built a bigger one morgan's that yacht was requisition no sorry that he sold it in 1890 and built, commissioned a new one that he also named Corsair and he wanted it to be very similar. The second one was requisitioned to fight in the Spanish Civil War. It became the USS Gloucester and then he built a third. I can't remember, I, sh I think the third was 200 and the second one was 241 feet and I think the third one was 285 feet. So each was longer than the last. Cragston. Cragston was his country house up the Hudson in Highland Falls on the west bank of the Hudson, which is the unfashionable side. The other side was called Millionaire's Row. But Morgan liked the west bank of the Hudson. Built his, It was an old farmhouse that he bought and moved into, but, it, but in the 80s had it remodeled. So he put in new porches and opened up the uh, lawns with spectacular views of the Hudson and had people up for 4th of July and planted thousands of daffodils along the shore that are still there. Bar Harbor. Bar Harbor was, he would go to Bar Harbor on his yacht. He didn't actually own a house there, but he would take parties of friends up to Bar Harbor on his yacht, and lots of his friends had houses there. So he usually would stay on the yacht, but other people would just come for a sale or for lunch or for dinner. 219 Madison. That was his house at Madison Avenue and 36th Street. He moved there in 1882. He bought the house in 1880. It was one of three that had been built in the 50s for the Phelps Dodge family. And he more or less gutted it. He had it re renovated and remodeled in 1880s style and moved in um, in 82. Where's the library? The library is next door to that, um, it, but it was not built until 1905-06. He had begun to collect seriously in the 1890s, and by the turn of the century, he had more books and manuscripts than his library, his private study could hold. So he had Charles McKim, who was the leading proponent of Rena Italian Renaissance architecture in New York, design him this beautiful Italian Renaissance marble villa that was right behind his house. 23 Wall Street. 23 Wall Street was his firm. It was originally the Drexel building, uh, built at the corner of Broad and Wall Street, right across from the New York Stock Exchange and the U.S. Sub-Treasury building. Um, it was Drexel Morgan until 
1895 when his partner Anthony Drexel died and then it became J.P. Morgan and Company and it remained J.P. Morgan and Company until recently when J.P. Morgan Company moved to 60 Wall Street and I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen to that building. It's still there. It was known as The Corner. You didn't even have to know the address. It was just called The Corner. That was the Morgan Bank. What is Morganization? The main thing that Morgan was doing from about the 1850s to the 1890s was both raise money for railroads and then um, watch over that money for his clients. There was not enough capital in America in the middle of the 19th century to build enormously expensive railroads. It had to come from Europe. And European investors who had been burned by reckless buccaneers in the 1830s and 40s weren't about to spend, send more money 3,000 miles across the Atlantic without some guarantee that it would be safe. Morgan, working in New York, working with his father in London, provided that guarantee. And that meant essentially finding sound properties, which meant for having good information about what were good railroads, and then taking what they called moral responsibility for watching over the capital that their clients had put up. So, say, a railroad that Morgan, for whom the Morgan Bank had sold bonds, went bankrupt. Morgan would take charge of the bankruptcy. He would, re fi he would fire the managers, hire new ones, reorganize the company, restructure its finances, appoint a board of directors, and including himself often, and stay on the board of the directors watching over the company's finances until the whole thing was restored to financial health. That reorganization came to be called Morganization. And he did it for railroads, as I say, from about the early 60s to the 1890s and then once the essential railroad structure of this country had been built which was basic, which kind of knitted this country together into one economic and geographical unit he turned to industrial corporations and he put together the first billion dollar corporation which was US Steel in 1901 he organized General Electric in 1892 he put together one of his partners put together International Harvester and they did the financing for AT&T most of those companies are still around. GE was the first, the only stock listed in the initial first Dow Jones Industrial Average, which was published in 1896, that's still in the average 100 years later. There's a panic of 1873, a panic of 1893, there's a panic of 1907. There are other panics in all this. What were the panics and what role did he play in them? Well, the panics were different from each other. Um, John Kenneth Galbraith has a wonderful line saying that they, they, they happened about every, t every 10 or 20 years throughout the 19th century, just about as long as it took the, a generation to forget about the last one. A lot of them had to do with how dependent we were on European capital and what was going on in the European markets, so that if some um, trouble started in Europe, it would often quickly cross the Atlantic and affect our markets. Also, we had an antediluvian banking system that had been designed for the pre-Civil War agrarian economy. And it wasn't really until 1913, after Pierpont Morgan died, that we developed a more sophisticated banking system and the Federal Reserve System came in. Morgan, the exact span of Morgan's lifetime was the period in which America had no central bank. And he really took it upon himself to act as the unofficial lender of last resort, Federal Reserve. He was trying to control these panics and to sort of keep the economy stable so that we wouldn't go through these terrible cycles of irrational boom and then terrible bust and depression. So the 73 panic was set off ostensibly, uh, officially by the failure of a railroad, the Northern Pacific, and Jay Cook, the banker, uh, a leading banker in Philadelphia, um, failed as a result of that. But it had European conditions had sort of started it off and then what's the, the, the cook failure was the thing that set the match to the tinder of the situation here. Um, the 93 panic was a whole different set of circumstances. I won't walk through all of them, but Morgan sort of took it as his public responsibility to try to mediate this a little bit. He would raise reserve funds among himself and several other bankers to try to supply liquidity when there wasn't enough, which is what would happen, that suddenly all the money would leave New York and there wasn't enough for people to meet their obligations. The most dramatic one was in 1907 when a trust company failed and it was, you could see the dominoes start to topple. Morgan by this time was in his 70, he had just turned 70, and he was off in an Episcopal convention in Richmond, Virginia. Teddy Roosevelt was president. There was no real authority in the federal government to, at this point to handle a crisis like this. It's hard for us to imagine this now because we're so used to the Fed stepping in and the Treasury Secretary trying to manage the situation like this, but Roosevelt didn't know much about it. The Treasury Secretary didn't have quite as mu very much authority. 
Morgan seemed to be the only person who had the ability and the means to do this. So his partners sent him cables in Richmond, Virginia about this developing situation, but they didn't want him to come back early because they thought that would spook the already scared markets. If everybody knew that Morgan had left this convention to come back to Wall Street, the panic would get even worse. So he waited till the last possible, till the convention was over, took a night train, arrived at his library on Sunday and spent the day in his library surrounded by his partners and lieutenants who briefed him on the situation. And then they decided they sort of did research about the institutions that were in jeopardy and decided which ones should be were not in very good shape and should be allowed to fail and which ones they ought to really ba um, bail out and try and stop the panic and for the next three weeks they essentially teams of financiers worked around the clock and morgan raised hundreds of millions of dollars to try to calm this panic and finally three by the end of three weeks he had but it involved shoring up the stock exchange um, these individual trust companies. At the end of that first week, New York City came to him and said, Mr. Morgan, we can't meet our payroll obligations and we're going to be bankrupt by Monday. And he managed to manufacture $100 million of clearinghouse certificates that essentially kept New York City going through the weekend. How it's much, an amazing story. How much money was he worth when he died at 75 years? Approximately $80 million. That's a little low because it was for estate, valued for estate purposes. There was no in federal estate tax at the time, but there was a New York state inheritance tax. But it was under $100 million. How much is that worth today? Well, you have to multiply by 15 or 20. So if we say it's $100 million, it would be about $1.5 million to $3 billion, $3 billion. So it was a lot of money. But not nearly as much as people imagined and not as much as other wealthy men at the time had. Morgan had bought out Andrew Carnegie when he put together U.S. Steel in 1901 for $480 million, of which Carnegie personally got half. So $240 million in 1901. Morgan didn't put up that money himself, obviously. He organized a syndicate to do it. John D. Rockefeller in 1913, when Morgan died, was already worth almost a billion 1913 dollars. And this is an apocryphal story, but I have to tell it anyway because it's too good. Um, Supposedly, when Morgan died, Rockefeller read about his net worth in the New York Times of $80 million, shook his head and said, to think he wasn't even a rich man. Where was he born? Hartford, Connecticut, 1837. What were his parents like? His father was a very successful merchant, Junius Spencer Morgan, who worked in Hartford and then Boston and then moved to London in 1854 to become an Anglo-American merchant banker and he and Pierpont basically were funneling European capital to the emerging American economy. I mean we really were the emerging economy in the 19th century. He was very conservative, very upright, very much concerned to build an international banking dynasty that would rival the Rothschilds and Baring brothers and he did. I mean over the next 80 years, the Morgan Bank, especially in America, so Rothschilds didn't really see what America was going to be. They had one man, August Belmont, who was very good. But Pier Junius Morgan staked the future on his son and on America. He was very, very supervisory and censorious and um, critical of his son and determined that his son was going to be sort of an upright man with a solid gold reputation. And Pierpont was not, he was not following in the paternal footsteps early on. He was much more likely to take risks, to speculate. Junius wouldn't hear of that and was furious whenever, Pier whenever Pierpont took a speculative flyer. At one point, Pierpont bought five shares of stock in something called the Pacific Mail and Steamship Company, and Junius hit the roof about how could you be so reckless and crazy. And, and Pierpont ignored him and kept the stock for a little while and then sold it at a loss. But if he'd held it for 10 more years, he would have done just fine. By the way, where are you from originally? California. Where? Los Angeles. How long did you live there? Lived there till I was 16. Then I went away to boarding school for two years, went, came east to college, moved to New York right after college, and basically have lived in New York ever since then. Where'd you go to college? I went to Radcliffe. Studied what? English literature. Not exactly preparation for the... It was a preparation for the James family, which was my last book, but, um, but no, I had the Morgans were quite an education for me. One of the things you mentioned on a couple of occasions is he was always playing solitaire. Yes. Does that say something about him? Well, I think it does. Again, because he says so little, it's hard to know. I'm just guessing. But one of his friends said this, and I think it's quite true. He was a man who was very intuitive and instinctive. He couldn't sit down and rationally analyze a problem, or if he could, he didn't, couldn't tell you about it. Um,
One of his partners said he's an impossible man to have any talk with. The nearest approach he makes is an occasional grunt. So I think he, he would sort of assimilate a lot of information, and his intelligence would work on a problem sort of out of his consciousness in a way. And he, often it's during a crisis when he's playing solitaire. It's a double pack game called Miss Milliken that was his favorite kind. And I think that doing that was very soothing. It kind of occupied a patterning numerical part of his mind. He would just play out these cards and figure out what goes with which and how does it match up. And then that it set the rest of his powerful faculties free in some way to work on the other problem. Say so he was a hypochondriac. Mm -hmm. In what way? Well, he had a lot of illnesses as a child. He almost died before he was two years old. He had seizures as an infant. And then vague, unnamed maladies sort of haunted him for the rest of his childhood. He was often kept out of school with sore throats and headaches and boils on his face and neck. Uh, actually, a virulent form of adolescent acne is often a precursor to this skin condition called rhinophyma that he had later in his life. So I suspect that's some of what it was, although they didn't know that at the time. He had rheumatic fever when he was 15 and was sent off to the Azores by himself, which was really hard for a young boy to go off like that on, to a rest cure in the sun. And then he began having depressions. Um, Got a photograph here that I found in Harry Evans' book on the American Century, which shows rather dramatically the condition of his face and nose. Uh, what at what year did this start? In his, I'm not sure exactly. It was in his late 40s or early 50s, so it would have been in the early 1880s. What impact did this have on others? I think it had a big impact. I mean, I think as you couldn't see him without in some way reacting to this. Um, so meeting strangers was a very difficult thing for him. It made him very shy. It made him hate being photographed. Um, so he was, he, he was already a shy, very private man because of his public reputation, because of his unorthodox private life. But also, since he was so hideously ugly, he didn't want to be photographed. It did not have much effect on his relationships with women. He'd always been attracted to and attractive to women. And certainly he was quite a good-looking young man, and his sense of self-confidence was established long before the nose got to be such a problem. You didn't show any of your, in your photographs, anything quite that, uh, uh, I don't know, what, how do you call it, grotesque. And here, here's the closest one I could find to in your book. Did you do that, on, avoid it on purpose? No, actually the one that is un, un, under your left hand with him at a graduation ceremony, the nose is hideous. The way the design of the book worked out, that is a small picture and you can't really see it, but the nose is in full bloom there. You just probably can't get close enough to see it. Is it this one at the bottom? The top, top. when he's, in, he's shaking somebody's hand at a graduation ceremony. Yeah, there we go. The, you can, you can, the light is actually on his nose, and we had wanted, I'd sort of initially thought we'd make that the big picture on this page, but the designer, and I actually agree that that other picture of him at the White Star Pier is so beautiful, we wanted to make that a big picture because it's unusual and it's a casual picture that one yeah what's That's, the white star pier the white star pier was the white star owned the titanic and morgan had put together the company that owned the titanic and that happens to be a picture in 1912 and as you will no doubt remember it was april of 1912 when the titanic went down i don't know whether that was before or after but much of morgan's art was supposed to have been on the titanic um it was just a fluke that it wasn't pujo committee Pujo Committee was uh, an investigation into whether or not there was a money trust in control of the American con economy. It, it, the, the hearings were held in 1912, but the impetus for it really came from the Panic of 1907 when Morgan single-handedly stopped this terrible panic. And for a moment after he did that, he was a national hero. Um, world bankers and international statesmen saluted him with awe for having been able to do this. But the next minute, America and a na this nation of Democrats was quite horrified that one private citizen had that much power. And it aroused America's long-standing distrust of private bankers and concentrated wealth. And it led to the setting up of a National Monetary Commission and eventually to the Federal Reserve. And in 1911-12, it, it also led Morgan and the men he was close to to try to concentrate a lot of financial power in their hands because they did not want a situation like that panic to happen again. And by 1911, it was thought in the re much of the rest of the country that they were running a money trust and that they had a stranglehold on credit and the availability of money in the country. So this congressional committee headed by Louisiana Representative Arsene Pujo 
um, began to hold hearings in 1911 and 12, actually 1912, and Morgan was called as a witness at, in December of 1912. He was the star witness. He was obviously the man they thought was running the money trust. So it was a very dramatic ending to his life. When did he die and where did he die? Died in 1913, March 31st in Rome. He had gone, he testified before this Pujo committee hearings in December of 1912. Then, um, went to Egypt, as he did every winter for the last few years of his life. And while he was on the Nile, he had sort of a nervous breakdown. He'd had depressive episodes his whole life. It was a big struggle. We were talking before about his hypochondria. Depression was a big part of it. And it started in his early 20s, and he never knew when it was going to come. And it was truly terrible, as anybody who suffers with depression knows. So he did what he could to ward it off. But the worst depression of his life came after these hearings on the Nile in, Dece in January of 1912. He died. He, he sort of had this breakdown. They got him from the Nile back to the Grand Hotel in Rome, and he died in Rome on the 31st of March. Where is this picture? That is his funeral service back in New York. The body was sent back to New York, and in April of 1913, the funeral was held at St. George's Church in Manhattan, and then the burial took place in Hartford, Connecticut, where he was born, and he was buried near his father and mother. You talk about the will. Who got the money? <laughs> Everything was left to his son, and when his father died in 1890, the father, the, the tradition in this family was very patriarchal. His father, Junius, left several million, you know, a few million dollars each to his daughters. His wife, Junius's wife, had predeceased him. And er, le, Junius left everything else to Pierpont. The bank, the houses, whatever art collections Junius had. And Pierpont did exactly the same thing. He gave $3 million each to his daughters. Um, his wife got the houses and... Uh, a trust fund that had been set up by Pierpont's own father and additional money from Pierpont, but everything else was left to his son. And, and um, his will was, uh, it opened with a resounding declaration of his Episcopal faith um, that Christ had died for his sins. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to quote it exactly, but something to the effect that I leave my soul to the hands of my Redeemer who may wash it in his blood and bring it cleansed before the throne of our Heavenly Father. And this, um, w much was made of this, as you might imagine, in the press. And preachers that Sunday all over the country um, were quoting this. And one irreverent newspaper, I think it might have been the Evening Post, said, well, this is all well and good, but it shouldn't lead us to conclude that godliness is profitable. Um, but some paper in Texas, reading those words in the will and then also the fact that he'd left everything to his son, the headline was, God, and Morgan leaves soul to maker, money to son. How old is he on the picture in the back of the book? It's 1860, so he's 23, and just before he married Mimi Sturgis. And then again on the front of the book? Probably about 70, 75. I'm not sure. I'd say 72 is a good guess. And our guest has been Gene Strauss, and this is the book called Morgan, American Financier. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian.